And with that, Wendy, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, Emily, can you confirm that we're sharing my screen? Uh, I can. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I am thrilled to be with all of you today, um, drinking your water, tea, whatever your favorite beverage is. Um, I am Wendy Gates Corbett. I am joining you from my home office in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the southeastern part of the U.S., where we are approaching, we are waiting uh, the approach of um, Tropical Storm, I think, Debbie, who will be um, dropping lots of water in these hair parts. So um, I want to just say right up front, but that just know that um, after this webinar, Emily's going to send a handout that has um, some of the main key points that we're going to um, explore today. So just know that this is coming to you right after the webinar. So I want you to think about one of your colleagues, someone in your network who is checked out. They are no longer engaged in their work. I want you to bring this person to mind. I'm gonna be silent for about 15 seconds while the timer counts down. I just want you to bring to mind someone you know and you care about who has checked out of their work environment. Think of that person. You don't have to name them, just think of them. And I realize that might be you. So I am curious, in the chat window, I, wanna, I want to see how do you know this person is checked out? What is it about them that demonstrates to you that they are just um, not having it anymore? What's their body language like or their, their verbal language? What are they doing or not doing? And Emily, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to point out some of them. Yeah, there's a lack of enthusiasm. They are low energy. What else? Yeah, she's not excited. All right, you got it. Mm -hmm. Oh, more yep. coming, Wendy, more coming. Very little eye contact. Yes, they used to be active and engaged in meetings, and now they're not. Yes. They used to, they are doing the bare minimum um, to get by. They are just calling it in. They are just barely doing anything. I will tell you that I got into this belonging work that I and research that I've been doing because there was a time in my professional career where that person was me. I had joined this company in what I thought was going to be the pinnacle of my corporate career. I had such high hopes to make a huge impact um, with this organization. I used my best people skills, my best rapport building and relationship building skills to try to create connection with my colleagues around the world. And I was never able to. The, th the walls and the silos in this organization were so thick and people were so, um, committed to how they were doing things and not committed to making any kind of change that I was unable to create relationships. And I felt like a failure. I felt like I wasn't, I, I questioned my own skills, my own um, talent. And eventually I left the company, but for the last three months of my employment there, I am not happy to say that I was the checked out person. I exhibited all of the behaviors that we're seeing in the chat window. Um, I remained muted in, um, in conversations. I did not raise my hand to help. I didn't freely share the information, the talent, the knowledge that I had to share. And I left that, um, that position feeling like a failure. It was that experience that got me interested in what do I wish my colleagues had done? What could they have done to help me feel like I belonged there? That question started my research into asking, what is it that creates a sense of belonging in the workplace? What can employees, can colleagues and leaders do to create a stronger sense of belonging? So in my, um, in my quest to answer that question, I assumed that somebody else had already answered that question. 
I devoured every piece of research and every resource I could find looking for that answer. And what I found is that what creates a sense of belonging, that list is a mile long and it's very individual for each of us. But what I did find in, in all of the resources that I consumed were three themes. Here's what I found. I found that um, in order for us to feel a sense of belonging in our workplace, we need to feel connected. Employees need to feel connected to the people they work with and to their larger organization. We need to feel connected to who we are working with and who we are working for. We also need to feel respected. We need to believe and know that our colleagues and our leaders respect our talents and our skills, as well as our contributions. And we need to feel protected. We need to feel safe and we need to feel that we have a foundation of mutually trusting relationships where we can have a bad day occasionally, where we can rely on our colleagues to be truthful with us and know that we can be truthful with them. Landing on these three themes was huge for me because it, um, it helped me grasp, it created a foundation of an understanding of behaviors. I am someone who always wants to know what behaviors, what can we do, how can we distill impact into specific behaviors. This was huge. What this led me to was something else that I discovered in everything that I, I um, consumed in looking for that answer. The other thing I noticed in every resource I read or listened to is that every author had a definition of belonging. And I would read these definitions of belonging and be like, ooh, I really like that, but I think there's something missing there. And then I'd read or listen to something else and I'd be like, ooh, I really like that definition of belonging, but there's something missing. So I did what every other author has done and I created my own definition of belonging. And I wanna know what you think about it. This definition sort of combines um, and uses duct tape or commas to pull what I think is the most comprehensive from uh, from all of the resources I've seen into what I think is a comprehensive definition. In my experience and in my research, I've discovered that belonging is actually an outcome. It's an emotion. It's how we feel when there is that sense of safety, when we feel supported by the people and the organizations around us. That happens when we feel welcomed, when we feel comfortable, that people are happy to see us and what we bring, that what we bring is respected and valued, is seen as important and making a difference. That happens when we feel accepted for who we are in all of our glory and all of our warts. That happens when we feel safe. Um, and it's not enough to just feel all of those things, but we also need to feel a part of something that is bigger than us, that is meaningful to us. So this is the start of my definition. And I wanna know that because belonging and what contributes to our sense of belonging is so individual, I wanna know what you would add to this to make this resonate uh, with you even more. So head over to chat. And, uh, and let's see what you would add to this to make this even more robust. We've got lots of commas. So what would you add? Listened to. Yeah, it means that we feel like we have a voice. Yes, when there is informal, unstructured, random, organic conversations occasionally, where there's that sense of team, that we-ness. Yes, love it. When we feel useful, absolutely. That's where we can see that what we're doing is making a difference and that our colleagues and our leaders know that we're making a difference. When we can be who we are, just as we are, when we are safe to make mistakes, where we don't have to cringe in fear. Ah, you guys, keep it coming. You are right on the money. 
So I'm curious, um, what, I've, what I've been um, elaborating on and, and developing is this stronger sense that, um, that when there is belonging, belonging contributes to the level of energy in a workplace community. And I am curious, if you think about your workplace community or a workplace community that you're familiar with, if it's not yours, how would you describe your workplace community? Is it positive? Are you excited to go to your next meeting to see the people that will be in that meeting? Are you um, are ideas shared where you build on each other's ideas, where um, there's that enthusiasm and um, sense of unity? Or when you think about the last meeting you attended, is it more negative? Is your energy drained when you think about it? Isn't it that ugh, dread? Um, I'm curious because what I've discovered is that when there is a sense of belonging, belonging contributes to the level of energy in organizations. So putting together this combination of this sense of energy and feeling connected, respected, and protected this was actually the launch of my research. I wanted to know what behaviors, what specific behaviors help us feel connected, respected, and protected. Once again, I went into, I assumed that somebody else had already answered those questions. So I went searching for answers and I couldn't find any. That is what sparked my research. So I created a survey, the Belonging at Work survey, where I simply asked you, I've asked um, and have, have received over 2,800 responses so far to simple open-ended questions that simply ask, what's one thing your colleagues do that help you feel connected to them? What's one thing your colleagues or your leaders do that help you feel respected? Um, and that those answers are gold in my mind because they are the specific behaviors. So this, these were, uh, it was like a gold mine. I have 2,800 ideas of what behaviors help us feel connected, respected, and protected. And then I took it one step further. And I said, okay, if these are the behaviors, this is what make us feel connected, respected, and protected. How can we make this happen? What behaviors can we do to spark, to make those happen more often? And the cool thing is, is that the answer to that question is counterintuitive. In my experience, we tend to think that what creates belonging, we, we think of belonging as a construct, as something theoretical. And the what creates a sense of belonging, what sparks those behaviors is not elaborate rocket science kind of, of behaviors. It's actually really simple behaviors that all of us can do, regardless of where we sit in an organization. So for example, I recently worked with an organization. When I go into organizations, I, I um, administer the Belonging at Work survey, and I gather anonymous responses to the questions. What This is one thing that makes me feel connected. It's one thing that, that helps me feel respected and protected. So in this company, um, one of the survey responses was, I feel connected to my colleagues here when you come talk to me in person instead of sending me an email. Now, obviously, this is a, a work environment where people are co-located. It's possible for someone to come see me in person. Um, so what I did with this, uh, with this scenario is um, the leaders and, and I brainstormed. We had a discussion of what behaviors, what could we do to spark this, to make this happen more frequently? And one of the leaders um, said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make a commitment to myself to go see one person in person at least once a day, All right? So is this a huge um, commitment? Is this a huge change? Does this require budget? Now, it does require a work environment where this is possible. That I understand. But this, this is what I mean by saying that, that what sparks the behaviors of belonging is not rocket science. It is simple behaviors. All right. So let's take a look at each of these in a little more, more detail. 
So I am curious. Um, so first, looking at, at connected, we feel connected. Uh, for us to feel a sense of belonging, we need to feel connected to the people we work with. Um, and we need to feel connected to the organization. So I want to know what's one thing that your colleagues do or your leaders that make you feel connected to the people in your work circles and head, head into chat. What's one thing that your people do? The people around you, whether it's physically or virtually. What's one thing that helps you feel connected to them? Ah, yes. When they acknowledge you, when they walk by your desk, when they say hello or make eye, con on eye contact, when they respond to your emails, yes. When they pop into your office and knock on your door, and hang out in your, your door frame for a little while, saying good morning, yes. All of these are simple. When there is time for small talk, exactly, you all are right on point. What I found is that when we, we feel connected, when we feel seen by the people around us, where we feel like we're not being ignored and we're not invisible, we also, to feel connected, we need to feel heard, that, that we have a voice and that when we use our voice, others are listening, not necessarily agreeing, but they are listening. So what we have to say is, is being listened to. And when people express interest in us as human beings, they wanna know how we're doing, they wanna know maybe what we did last weekend or how, um, how your child's play went. Yes, exactly. So uh, I have called some of the responses from the 2,800 responses to the survey. And here are some three of the most common responses to, I feel connected to my colleagues when. Here are, here are three that will look familiar to you. I feel connected when we get to talk about stuff that's not necessarily work, when we laugh together, and when we've had conversations before and they remember something about that conversation. Now, I will tell you, that of, of all of the 2,800 responses, this one is the number one response to every single question. I feel more connected to my colleagues when we occasionally talk about stuff that's not work, when we are not 100% work 100% of the time. This doesn't mean that we need to, to schedule a half day event or that we need to add a half hour to every single meeting. It is just occasionally making time to talk about stuff that's not work. So these are some of the behaviors. So for example, I love sunflowers. They are my favorite flower. And recently my friend Annie was grocery shopping and she was in, in the flower aisle. She came across this bunch of sunflowers and she took about 12 seconds to snap a picture of it and send me the text. All right, so did she order flowers and send them to me? Did she spend money to send me a bouquet of flowers? Maybe she did with her text, with her um, phone plan, but she didn't actually spend money. She took 12 seconds of her precious time to let me know that she thought of me when she saw these sunflowers. It is really, I agree, yes, Emily, it is the little things that make a big impact. So how can we do these little things? What behaviors can we use to spark a sense of belonging, a sense of connection? Here are three simple ideas that you can take and adapt as you see fit to your environment. Occasionally eat lunch or take a break away from your desks, away from your screens, and talk about something that's not work. We've, we've got the Olympics going on. It's a great opportunity to, um, a great non-work topic. Make an effort to share funny moments together, whether it's showing a, a funny picture on your phone or telling a story about one of the photos on your, your phone um, or a recent mishap um, or doing what um, Annie did with the sunflowers and taking a moment when something in your life reminds you of one of your colleagues, take a moment to let them know. You're not asking them to do anything. You're just letting them know, oh, I thought of you. 
These are the simple non-rocket science things that can spark a sense of connection. Now let's look at respect. What can we do um, to, what do we need to feel respected? In order for us to feel a sense of belonging, we need to feel respected by the people we work with in 360 and um, all around us at all levels. So I'm curious, think about your work circles. You can go um, peril, you can go peers, um, leaders, or direct reports, doesn't matter. I'm curious, what are things that your colleagues do, people in your work circles do, that show that they respect you? I know for me, somebody mentioned promptly responding to my emails. That's a big one for me. Even if they say, I can't respond right now, but I got it. Yes, when our ideas are listened to, yes, even if they're not implemented, when somebody asks us for our ideas, when somebody listens, yes, Reginald, when they listen more than they speak, when they ask your opinion, exactly. Yes, when they say no, I would. I wish I could help you. I'm just not in that place right now. That's so much better than committing to something and then falling short of that commitment. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, Emily, when you know that you've got their full attention, you all know when somebody looks to their other screen or they look down, they hear the ping or we all hear that buzz. Yes. When they remember your birthday or some other um, significant event in your life, you got it. Keep going. Keep going. We feel respected by our peers and our leaders when our contributions, when our skills, when our opinions, when our ideas are acknowledged and not ignored. Um, when we feel appreciated, when somebody says thank you, when someone says, I appreciate that you stayed late um, that you put in extra effort to make this happen. Yes, when, when, oh my gosh, yes, Martina, when we acknowledge and respect boundaries and uh, work hours, and when we feel valued, what we bring, what we contribute is valued by our peers, by our leaders, and by the organization. So from the survey responses, here are, um, here are three common um, additions to what you've already said in chat from uh, from around the world. I feel respected by the people I work with when they ask me what I think, or when I'm invited to bring uh, to give input in a discussion or a project because people know I have a particular experience or a particular skill set that might be helpful. And when they say thank you or I appreciate you, when they recognize our contributions. Now, for some people that they don't want public recognition, part of all of this is recognizing and getting to know the people in your work circles, to know them well enough that maybe Emily doesn't want the shout out um, on the, the company intranet, maybe a personal thank you email or voicemail or text that says thank you might be more appropriate for her but getting, making an effort to know and to take the time to say thank you, to appreciate. So here are three sparks that we can do to make an effort to, to show the people in our work circles that we respect them. We can ask them for their advice, whether this is work related or not, even something personally uh, outside of work. And for those of us, and um, I know I've got a, a lot of learning and development, training and development peeps in, um, in the, the audience, how good does it feel when somebody says, oh my gosh, I learned this from you? Again, whether it's work-related or not, to know that we are contributing or that someone has contributed to, um, to our learning, whether it's work-related or not. One of the things that, um, that has that I've been working on is making a bigger effort to tell the people in my work circles something about them that I admire. Um, because for me, it shows respect. Um, and I always appreciate, and I'm always flabbergasted when people tell me something that they admire about me. I'm like, really? Oh my gosh. Um, it means a lot. And so I am making an effort to um, reciprocate. 
before we um, open it up for a conversation and before we practice creating a spark um, as a group, the last uh, theme in my research is that we need to feel protected. For us to feel a sense of belonging, we need to feel protected by the people around us, that there are reciprocal trusting relationships, that are respectful trusting relationships. So what, one of the things that was interesting, this is where my research um, actually flipped a bit because initially I would ask, as part of the survey, I would ask, what's something that makes you feel vulnerable or what makes you feel protected or safe at work? And I found that people were having a really hard time putting their, their um, finger on it. It was really hard to tap into but they would often and really quickly turn it around and say, I can tell you what makes me feel unsafe or when I feel exposed or vulnerable. So I flipped the question around and this was fascinating. The responses here are fascinating because sometimes it's things that we had no idea that when I do this, it makes you feel unprotected. So I am curious, what's something that makes you feel unprotected or vulnerable in a work situation. Head over to chat. What's something that makes you feel unprotected? Oh my gosh, yes. When they, when they call out your mistake or they call you out in public because of a mistake. Oh my gosh, the sarcasm. Oh, yes. Oh, I do not like BCC line copy. Yes, exactly. When you hear people gossiping, even if it's not about you, that's right. When you copy the world on your email, yes, come talk to me in person or directly, not necessarily in person. Yes, when yeah, when your um, efforts to create to take initiative maybe are are received as overstepping a boundary or you know you're making us look bad, you're making me look bad. Oh my gosh, yes. And I would bet, um, I and I would hope that some of the examples that you're seeing in chat, you're like, oh my gosh, I never even thought of that. That's exactly why. These responses and this question has been so powerful because sometimes we don't realize what um, are the difference between our intention and the way we act and how it's received. So we feel protected, to flip this around, we feel protected in our work environments when we believe and we know that people are being treated fairly and that decisions are being made fairly. That's when we feel, um, we need that to feel protected. We also feel protected when our leaders and our colleagues are as transparent as possible. Now, I know there are tons of us that are in workspaces. Um, our organizations are in tremendous amount of flux and there is a lot of change going on. So I am not implying that we need to have 100% transparency. But when there is trust, we know and believe that our colleagues are being as transparent and as forthcoming as possible given the situation. All right, so here are, um, in addition to your responses in chat, which are amazing, thank you. Here are three of the common responses to this survey question. And um, I wanna know what you think about them, yeah. I feel exposed or unsafe. I feel vulnerable when nobody backs me up, when it's obvious in a meeting that you don't have my back, or when what they say does not align with what they do, when their words and actions are incongruent, um, and when they interrupt me mid-sentence. Now, I, I will be vulnerable, be vulnerable here for a minute because this is something that I learned recently, or I relearned um, recently. So this, uh, this example, when somebody interrupts me mid-sentence, until this recent experience, I read this as somebody who thinks they have more power interrupting me. 
So they think what that what they have to say is more important. But I learned this lesson in a recent conversation. I was doing a, a read along um, with my book that we'll talk about in a moment um, with an organization and we were doing a, a discussion and it was a, a really energized, invigorating discussion. And, the, and unfortunately in this situation, we didn't have name tags and there was a woman who, so there were no name tags and there was a woman, um, it, there was such positive energy in the room and we're like, oh my gosh, yes, I love when my colleagues do, you know, I love when they give me a kudos. I love when they do this. I love, so we were brainstorming. It was positive energy. And there was this one woman in the room whose name I did not know, who was also excited. So when one person would start talking, she'd be like, oh my gosh, yes, I love that. Yes, me too. And she ended up interrupting this person and she ended up interrupting everyone. And I um, felt bad that I didn't know her name. So I, I struggled and I remained silent because I didn't know how to say, excuse me, what's your name? Can you please be quiet? And so I didn't say anything. And what I take from that experience is I regret creating an environment where several people in the group felt, even though it was positive energy and excitement, even though it was a positive experience and it was um, positive feedback, people were still being interrupted and they, they did not have um, the microphone because somebody would take it from them. That's what I remember. So for those of you who, um, particularly my learning and development folks who, who want to facilitate conversations and want to encourage um, engagement, help me um, and learn with me a reminder to, even if it's positive interruption for positive reasons, people still feel squashed. Um, so that's a lesson that, um, that I have earned the hard way. So that's me being vulnerable. So what can we do? Uh, we can, uh, how can we create a stronger sense of protection for those around us? We can model transparency. Um, I hopefully just model transparency by, by showing a vulnerable side of ourselves, being able to say, um, share a mistake we've made or acknowledge that there is something that we are working on. Um, don't allow ideas to be disregarded. This is something that uh, that that I'm also working on as a facilitator, um, particularly when I work with senior leaders, making sure that there is space um, for all ideas to be heard and not disregarded. Um, and then lastly, being able to offer to help someone. We all have um, we all have uh, lots on our plate. And if there is something small that we can do to help our colleague, um, it will go a long way to show that they've got our back um, and vice versa. Um, so there are small things that we can do to help our colleagues feel more connected, respected, and protected. So I've shared nine examples of, um, of sparks, and I want us to crowd, I want to crowdsource a, um, a spark. So for example, I know this slide has a lot of words on it. These are the three common examples, uh, common responses to, I feel connected to my colleagues when, I feel respected, I feel protected when. And so I'm, I have randomly singled out this one. All right, I feel, res I feel respected by my colleagues when someone asks me for my advice. All right, how can we make that happen more? Often, let's. Um, I know we've got some. We've got regardless of whether you are a learning and development person, an HR person, or neither of those. Um, many of us spend a lot of time in meetings. Um, if you are a training and development person, you want to think about how can you ask someone's advice in a training class. Let's start with A in a meeting. How can we ask someone's advice in a meeting? whether, and you can take this from whether you are leading the meeting or maybe you are an attendee or participant in the meeting. How can we ask for someone's advice? Put your responses in chat. 
Yes. Ah, uh, I know you have experience in this. What do you think? Yes. Or I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yes. I'm curious to know how you see it. I love these examples. These are all wonderfully put. I love the um, both the similarity and the, the nuances of how they're different. To draw out, yes, Reginald, drawing out the introverts who have great ideas, who may not want, uh, may not, may wait to be invited. Yes, what are your thoughts, Arpana? Oh, I love them. Thank you. And I want to encourage you to, to scroll through these to get some new ideas for how else you might uh, phrase and um, ask for someone their advice. Yes, you are right, Kim. Yes, using people's voice um, names does mean a lot to them. All right. So now I want to think about um, option B in a training class. And again, whether you are a, a training professional or not, um, think about in a training class, how could we um, how could we ask for someone's advice? Kathy Zotman, love that. Yes, that's a great question. Does anybody else want to um, anybody else have thoughts on the topic? Does this make sense to you? Oh, love it. Yes, what's your experience? Ooh, what would your approach be? Oh my gosh, I love these. Yes. One of the things that I do in my training classes um, and um, in the class that I teach is I will, if somebody asks me a question, I will sometimes say, I have some thoughts about that, but, but I'm curious, what do the rest of you think? Yes, let's get your point of view. Oh my gosh, love them. These are great. I love these options. And even, you know, you can do something like this, like this conversation we have just had um, in chat. You can have this with your colleagues, with your coworkers, your, um, your fellow leaders to, to brainstorm other ways to, um, to ask for someone's advice. And really for any of these, any of these examples or any ideas for connecting, respecting and protecting with your colleagues, you can have conversations like this, like what's one way that you would do this? And you can, yes, before sharing my thoughts, Sharon, before I share my thoughts, I'd love to hear yours. Love this, thank you. So one of the other um, questions I get often when I work with organizations is, okay, we are ready to do this. The Belonging at Work survey has given us examples of the behaviors in our organization that create a sense of, um, help us feel connected, respected, and protected. How can we measure whether it's making an impact? My simple answer to that, my first answer to that is to look at what you're already measuring for example, in um, from an organizational perspective, uh, many of many of the organizations I work with are doing um, engagement surveys. So look at the questions in your engagement surveys that reflect connected, respected, the definitions of respected, protected, sorry, and um, and respected. So you can look at what the behaviors are, um, some of the behaviors that that we've identified, and see which questions measure those. So I've also worked with organizations that um, are working to build capacity specifically in their leaders. Now, um, these behaviors, and um, it is every employee, regardless of position and where they are in the organization, that can and does build a sense of belonging. But um, some of the organizations I work with, uh, I work with their leaders to develop uh, their ability to be intentional about being more inclusive. So for example, one of the companies I'm working with is um, has threaded the, these concepts and the behaviors in their inclusive leadership program. And so as part of their performance evaluations, they, um, they are looking at, they have threaded into their 360 some of these behaviors that demonstrate connect, respect, and protect. So my first thought in how can we measure this impact 
is to look at what you're already measuring and look at how what you're already what you are already measuring and how it relates to connect, respect, and or protect those behaviors. All right, so we have um, elaborated on what makes us feel connected, respected, and protected. I got into this work because I wanted to get down to the behaviors. I wanted to know what my colleagues could have done to make me feel not invisible, to, to open their arms virtually uh, and make me feel connected, respected, and protected. I don't want anyone in any organization to feel invisible or that they don't belong. So the, the research that I've done has, and I'm continuing to do, um, helps identify specific behaviors that we can do so that people don't feel invisible and they feel a stronger sense of belonging. I've got a couple of, of additional slides, but before we head to those, Emily, I wanna open it up for questions um, and comments. Yes, so as I said earlier, the uh, question Q&A area is open, so feel free to send in your questions to Wendy. Um, and while we wait, Wendy, I just wanted to send a huge, like, this has been incredible. I feel like oh. you're taking notes and screenshots every couple seconds. Um, right. How everyone else feels, but that's been my experience thus far. Um, also, I wish you could just like be my hype woman in life. I will be your hype woman, Emily. I got you. <laughs> I appreciate you endlessly. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them in and we'll be sure to address them. Great. As you're typing, um, I will um, share this slide um, and Emily has or will um, put the links um, in chat that um, I published my book, The Energy of Belonging. I published it in January of this year. And the folks at, um, thank you, huge thank you to Emily, who was pivotal um, in making my book. She, she made my, she blinked my book. I have learned that term. Um, so uh, The Energy of Belonging is available um, through Blinkist. Um, for those of you who are premium Blinkist or Go One um, members, great, you've got access to it. But Emily took it a step further and has made the Blink for the Energy of Belonging available for free um, through the end of August. Um, and yeah, if you want to book, check it out, thank you. Um, and if you are so inspired to buy the book, um, you can buy it at your favorite retailer, including Amazon. Yes, and we've shared both of those links in there as well. Um, and then we do have a question here, Wendy, if you'd like to sure. take it. So Marjorie is asking, how do you deal with a team member who gives every impression that they don't want to belong? They never turn up to, to in-person meetings because, quote unquote, I don't need to. Oh, that was such a drain. I, um, I relate. Um, and it is it is hard, especially if you are that person, um, it is hard to be checked out. Um, and if you are Marjorie, who wants that colleague to feel a stronger sense of belonging, um, what I would say is it, if I were in that situation, Marjorie, I would do my best efforts to um, demonstrate that, that I respect who they are um, and that I, um, I may be seeking their advice. And if they are expressing one of those walls that they do not want to be, um, they don't want to be known, they don't want to engage in non-work conversation, that part of, of um, respect is acknowledging and honoring someone's boundaries. Um, I would also look at uh, maybe seeking that person's advice for something. Uh, maybe if they are not in a meeting, they don't attend a meeting. Um, if you can think of something that that you could seek their advice or their input on from an individual perspective. Um, but I, I also know that unfortunately there are, that we can't make someone want to belong if someone wants to remain checked out or they just don't want to belong for whatever their reasons are. We can't force them to. So I, I understand that's such a, 
a, a conflict and a challenge. I appreciate that challenge. Yeah, I think we have one other question coming in. And mm -hmm. I just want to add to that, Marjorie, because I've had a similar experience with a colleague before um, that I was managing where they weren't showing up to meetings and it was mm -hmm. a recurring theme over multiple years. And so we really tried to spend a lot of time in our one on one meetings, at least digging into mm -hmm. how we can make them more comfortable. And it actually ended up being and I'm not saying this is the same. I mean, you could have someone that is just like, no, I'm out, like mm -hmm. not interested. Mm -hmm. um, but in our, like my experience with it, it actually ended up being that he had a fear of being in group settings. Mm. And so we were trying to see, okay, what if it's like two or three people in a meeting? Um, so it is, I think, an option to kind of dig a little deeper too, if they're comfortable yeah. sharing one-to-one, -one, there might be more to it. Oh my gosh, Emily, that's such a great example of seeking to understand demonstrating interest in the person in a different way, not necessarily, you know, about the, um, how your cat's doing, um, but who they are as a person in terms of being uh, their comfort level and what makes them comfortable. That's a great idea. And I would also add, um, if anybody else has suggestions um, before I actually, after I've shared my thoughts, I'm curious to know what you would think. <laughs> So if, if any of you in the audience have suggestions for Marjorie, um, I invite you to share them uh, in the chat window. I would also uh, I also want to extend this. Um, this is a, a document that I created specifically for, um, for, for talent development or training folks. And it is, but you are welcome, or even if you are not a, a training person, uh, there are 10 ideas that you can use to fold fold a stronger sense of belonging, be intentional about um, fostering belonging in your training programs or your meetings. Feel free to adapt to your meetings. So you can use them into your training content. And there are five ideas for building it into your building belonging into your training content and five ideas for to build belonging in your training delivery or your facilitation. So please feel free to download this and adapt it to anything you facilitate um, and any content you create, have at it. Um, I believe Emily has put this in chat. So I- Wait, wait um, Wendy, we have two more questions. Oh, good, yay, yay. I'm so I've just stuff. shared one. Um, so Reginald asked, what are your thoughts about ensuring senior managers align their behaviors to the often published company values of the organization? Often senior leaders don't <laughs> role model the values they expect of others. I feel like what? this is, I'm like giggling because no. it's like, yup, sounds about no. right. Reginald, totally with you. <clears throat> well, I will also crowdsource this if, um, if any of you have suggestions um, for Reginald as you are typing those, I will also share. What I see um, that often works more is, as many of us know, what's, what gets measured is what gets done. Um, so I um, often work with organizations to see what are the senior leaders being evaluated on, what is part of their performance. Um, so I also um, agree that, that um, they there is often a difference with what um, what they do, what they say, and what they do, or what they do and how it aligns or does not align with organization values. Um, and part of that is, you know, sometimes it can come from the bottom up. Who any of us who has a um, wants to make a difference in the sense of belonging can model demonstrating, connecting, respecting, and protecting their colleagues and or their leaders. Um, but often I would say that what gets measured is what gets, is the um, the behavior that gets um, demonstrated more often. So true. Reginald, I hope that was helpful. Speaking of our three areas we're covering here, I have one from Eric that I will share. Which of the three dimensions do we on average have the biggest potential? I love that we're uh, focusing on potential here. That makes me really happy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I love this question, Eric. Um, I 
on the one hand, I think it's um, it's individual uh, because some of us, for example, many of my training and development peeps, we are we um, have skill and talent in connecting with others, whether it's learners or um, instructional designers, people on their team. It's it's often a skill that's um, innate as well as um, developed. But there may be um, certain uh, some training professionals may not um, be as strong in creating a, a psychologically safe or protected environment. So I think it's varied. I think it is very individual. I think what I've seen most often people respond to is wow, where their eyes are open most and they see the most potential for change in themselves is with protect, with psychological safety, particularly because we have to get out of our own head and and in our assumptions of what makes us comfortable is what's going to make other people comfortable, and we have to be more outwardly focused and intentional. Um, but I also think that that it is very individual. Not me Thank on the all. side here. I'm trying to really quick pull up the webinar. So I'm going to put a webinar in the chat that actually Wendy was on with us on the Blinkist <laughs> side, um, where we do talk about psychological safety as mm -hmm. well. It was a panel. Um, so highly recommend checking that out as well. You just fill out a form and you'll get the recording um, to just keep the knowledge going. Uh, and I just want to give you, Wendy, as we close out, any last words of wisdom or things you'd like to share? I want you to know, I mean, I hope that I have um, supported your thinking that you can create a sense, you can do something to create a stronger sense of belonging, and you can amplify the belonging that is already there um, with simple behaviors. Wherever you are, it makes a difference. I want to encourage you to be that spark. Um, and I also want to encourage you to please connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with all of you. Thank you so much for being here and amplifying your own interest in what you can do to create a stronger sense of belonging and go do it. And Emily, thank you. You are the host extraordinaire as you always are. Oh, Wendy, you're the sweetest. Um, thank you all so much for being here today, Wendy. Thank you, as always. Um, hopefully this storm doesn't get too bad that we're both in the middle of, I feel like, right now. Um, this has been incredible. Please, everyone that's here, look out for the recording. You'll get it. Uh, it'll be like right after the webinar closes. It'll take a minute to kind of like buffer, and then you'll get it. Um, and stay tuned for the next one. Wendy, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone.